to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybel Inc. My name is Pete Wright. That over there is Howard Tybel. Hello, Howard. Hello, Pete. I love, I love saying that. Hello, I mean, Pete. You're getting really good at I, it. I it do just it really time. trips it's off the tongue. getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Creature, you know, creatures it's one of syllable. It's, you know, it's, just, it's easy to do. Thing I want to talk about today, Howard. We I see these questions that come up on on you know in in the media, the the higher ed media circuit. Uh, you know, how do we fix higher ed? How do we save higher education? Uh, you know, we we know that there are so many issues about higher ed that that are that things that are not working, that things that we have the sense that are are somehow broken. And my question for you is, uh, uh, is higher ed something that we can save? The short answer is no, we can't save it. It is going down a path that we need to step outside of trying to figure out how to keep it as it is or preserve it as it is and ask more important questions like, where is it going? How do we better meet the needs of these new students? But not in the context of fixing. See, when I hear the word fix, when people talk about fix, what I think they're really saying is, how can we tweak it, not cause any pain, uh, not do anything that would be too radical, but just put enough in place that we can keep the, everything as, as is, but satisfy the fact that there are some other things happening around us. I think people are way underestimating uh, what's coming in the next five to ten years. And in some cases, it might, be, it might be even be sooner. Uh, you know, the, the whole MOOCs debate is so interesting because y- you hear it as, people advocating for this is going to disrupt higher education and other people saying it's a fad. You hear very little. Well, before you, you're dropping, you're dropping terms here. Go ahead and d- tell people what, what a MOOC is. The massive, massive open online courses. So the, the for-profits uh, and, and some that are nonprofit have created these, and I'm sure we've all seen the different examples of these in, in different domains. Uh, where people can sign up for a course taught by an MIT professor for free, something that he delivers to his undergraduate class, becomes available, 50,000 people sign up, and we discover that there's another way to educate people. Now, there are so many good arguments for that it is not yet ready for prime time. That's different from saying... There is a wave coming, and we and there are people who are figuring out how to continuously improve that. So, to me, the debate is not if; the debate is when. And that is also another great uh, analogy that I read in this article. I'll be leading a, a board retreat, and it's called an avalanche is coming. And the, the wonderful metaphor of an avalanche is that if you look at an avalanche, if you look at a mountain from a distance, it looks serene and peaceful and you can see all the snow. What you don't see is what's happening underneath the surface, you know, 20 or 30 or or 50 foot deep. And there is all of this rumbling going on, and there is going to be an avalanche. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and where. And that's what we're dealing with here. And instead of people treating it like that, uh, they're saying, they're debating if it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Now, what it is, is also obviously open for debate. But what is not happening enough of is serious debate, not just in the media, but in the institutions, at the board level, at the cabinet level, with the faculty. What do we do about the fact that this is coming? Uh, There's still this significant denial about that it is coming, and it's rooted in years and years and years of people making dire predictions about higher ed and it not coming true. So your your contention here is that we're now making dire uh, predictions about higher ed that are coming true. And, and that's and, the change. We're, we're in the middle yeah. of a, the boy who cried wolf uh, kind of a situation. Absolutely. There's a boy that cried wolf, and this is how we deny it. And, and it, dire meaning... Not dire like it's going to die. What's what's happening here is there are new delivery systems. There are new ways of thinking about 
uh, new ways of connecting with students. There are, is a whole different set of demands that higher ed is still trying to figure out how to get around, which is how students want to learn. You know, it's fascinating. I've, I've been doing work in the K-12 through independent schools. They've been talking forever around flipping the classroom. It is now slowly making its way into uh, higher education, this idea that instead of the 100-person lecture hall, the Harvard model where, where the expert stands out in front and everybody takes notes, that the time when we're together is going to be when we're going to collaborate and the learning happens offline. The, 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 the technology is absolutely making that available. Now, there are things to work out, like how do you motivate an 18, 19-year-old to, in their own dorm room, do the learning as opposed to being forced to sit through a lecture. But the truth is, more and more of these lectures are being taped anyways, and this is how students are getting them. So... I don't know if you. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is. yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you, go, you, you go. know, I just, I, I just feel like it's, it's important to, to add that so many of these discussions about whether or not we're going to, to f- fix higher ed or save higher ed or fix the, the learning model is rooted in our own experience of when we were last comfortable in the business, right? In the delivery of education, right? The, the implication of saying we want to fix something or save it is we need to take something we perceive as broken and we want to take it back to a state when it was something that was by our own uh, definition unbroken and so when you when you mention a you know an 18 year or 19 year old who's sitting in a giant lecture hall uh, I, it's easy for me to think back to being an 18 or 19 year old sitting in a giant lecture hall but that is not uh, I would say uh, the experience, as you say, of that lecture hall is not the same experience of today's 18 or 19 year old. And there are progressive faculty yeah. that are out doing things differently and, and not focused on this idea of trying to recreate some magic that there we had 20 to 30 years ago, but to celebrate what we have now and, and that maybe fixing is not so much the word, but does higher ed need recreating? That's great. I don't know. I may Powerful be doing, conversation. No, that was excellent. A powerful conversation there is to have here uh, for for institutions internally, for leaders in these institutions, are what traditions are 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 worth preserving in terms of moving forward. See, I think we instead we what we do is we we, we feel threatened by tradition uh, being impinged upon that it somehow if we give into this change. We're going to lose some of the core traditional models uh, of what higher ed has offered. And I think that a, a, a more relevant, appropriate conversation is let's recognize tradition is important. What are those traditions we want to retain? And what are those things that are going to speak to our core audience of the future? Not just the audience of today, but the audience for five years from now, because I'll tell you something, it's going to take multiple years for institutions to rework their academic curriculum and program to accommodate this future generation. And if they don't start working on it now, they're going to find themselves playing serious catch-up when there's an emergency because they are, they are losing ground on, for example, being able to demonstrate outcomes uh, from these kinds of programs, uh, or students hearing more uh, sort of publicly how certain institutions have reworked their curriculum and the engagement in that, in, at that level, that institution, is profoundly different than the traditional models of, of the schools who are still sitting with the old model. Now, what's interesting is there are people that say there's some schools that don't need to care. There's some schools like you know, the prestige schools like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford, they don't have to care. I disagree. I'm not, I think those schools are probably experimenting with this even more powerfully. All of this MOOCs stuff is being generated at the prestige level, and these schools understand that they're experimenting. They're not changing the model right now. What they're doing is they're seeing how to make it work. The rest of the schools are the middle-tier, very high-priced liberal arts schools, they're in a position to say, all right, do we, are, do we find ourselves willing to experiment 
with this, not decide what we're going to do, but be part of the conversation sufficiently so that we don't find ourselves uh, not engaging the faculty. It starts, Pete, with there needs to be a, a willingness to engage and, and have this kind of conversation with the different stakeholders together in the room. And that's one of the things that I'm looking to do more and more of in finding ways of bringing faculty and administrators, trustees together. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be leading a board retreat where that's going to happen, where it's going to actually going to involve faculty, administrators, and the board in a conversation about are we, is our mission and how we're thinking about a mission, do we need to step back and go, uh, in what way do we need to change, uh, given the realities of the price sensitivity, our inability to raise tuition anymore, the high discount rates? There is there is very little room, and I, I don't I don't think there's anybody arguing at this point that we're going to go back to a point where we can go back to five to eight uh, percent tuition increases, and there are no other financial levers unless you get incredible philanthropy, you know, to save the day. Uh, so there is, a, there is a reality that's here right now, and I, I think that anybody sitting in, we're going to go back to the days where we can continue to subsidize programs that uh, are not being utilized, although they'd be a wonderful thing to offer here, or certain kinds of athletic programs that nobody's doing but maybe two board members uh, put in place 20 years ago, and now we have it and we keep losing money, those kinds of conversations are the ones that are very difficult to have but need to start happening, and it's a leadership conversation. Presidents need to get in there and say, we're going to have these tough conversations. And that's, that's the work that we're in the middle of right now. It's very exciting. Oh, it's very powerful, uh, just getting people to ask that question and realize that, you know, if, if you turn the tables, in some cases, those conversations become easier. Conversations about, you know, uh, big endowments in sports and athletics and, and tenure versus pay for performance and, uh, you know, facilities and growth versus, uh, on you know, uh, online investment and, you know, MOOCs. Exactly. You know, those questions become easier when, you, when, you, when you're not trying to repair something that is perceived as broken. Uh, but create That's something. Right. That's right. Powerful. So, where do we want to go? Yeah. yeah. That's great, Pete. That's Love right. it. Great conversation, Howard. Thank you so much for your time, as always. Um, we, you can find us. Couldn't do it without you. You know that, Pete. No. You, are the, you are the question king. Well, you know how to ask a question better than anybody I know. Oh, you know, you try stuff. That's all I'm saying. I do. Uh, we, you can find us at tybelink.com, and uh, you can also find us, you know, we should say this more often, you can find us on Twitter at uh, Howard Tybel, or you can reach out to me at Pete Wright if there are questions you think that we ought to be talking about on this podcast. We would sure love your input, so thank you so much for, for reaching out, for lending us your ears. Uh, subscribe to the show in iTunes or Stitcher Smart Radio, and until next week, we'll catch you on Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybelink. Thank you.